This Sunday, Republicans block the January 6th commission. Donald Trump's big lie has now fully enveloped the Republican Party. Only six Republicans vote for an independent panel to investigate the assault on the Capitol. It doesn't look like we're going to have the opportunity to get the answers that way. I think the basic goal of our Democratic friends is to keep relitigating in public what happened back on January 6th. What this vote says about our democracy. I'll talk to former Republican Congresswoman Barbara Comstock, who spent the week unsuccessfully lobbying Republican senators, and Democratic Congressman Jason Crow of Colorado. Plus, the Wuhan lab mystery. We cannot exclude the possibility of some kind of a lab accident. Growing concerns that the coronavirus leaked from that lab in Wuhan, China, prompt President Biden to order a new U.S. intelligence investigation. We need to get to the bottom of this, whatever the answer may be. What he announced yesterday is too little and too late. My guest this morning, former Deputy National Security Advisor Matthew Pottinger and Dr. Peter Hotez of Baylor University. And the anniversaries of two racially charged events, the murder of George Floyd and the 1921 Tulsa race massacre. How the Floyd case and its aftermath may have helped a nation acknowledge what happened in Tulsa 100 years ago. Joining me for insight and analysis are NBC News White House correspondent Jeff Bennett, former Obama deputy campaign manager Stephanie Cutter, Aisha Roscoe, White House correspondent for NPR, and former White House political director for George W. Bush, Sarah Fagan. Welcome to Sunday. It's Meet the Press. From NBC News in Washington, the longest running show in television history, this is Meet the Press with Chuck Todd. And a good Sunday morning, and I hope you're enjoying this Memorial Day weekend wherever you are, and you may actually be somewhere other than your house. Uh, If Friday's Senate vote on an independent commission to investigate January 6th was a stress test for our democracy, well then sadly, our democracy failed and failed big time. Republicans managed to block the commission, even with 54 senators voting for it. It was still six votes short of the 60 needed to defeat a Republican-led filibuster. Not surprisingly... Democrats condemned the Republicans for their nearly unanimous opposition. Shame on the Republican Party for trying to sweep the horrors of that day under the rug because they're afraid of Donald Trump. Also, not surprisingly, the Republicans voted down the commission after their leader, Mitch McConnell, came out publicly against it. There's no new fact about that day. We need the Democrats' extraneous commission to uncover McConnell's been honest uh, publicly and made it plain that he believes the more attention and sunlight cast on January 6th, the worse it will be politically for Republican candidates in 2022, pure and simple. That's why he's against it, period. So on a Memorial Day weekend, when we honor men and women who gave their lives defending our democracy, this Congress has chosen not to establish a bipartisan commission to investigate the worst attack on our capital, the citadel of this democracy, since the War of 1812. Among those disappointed by this vote was Barbara Comstock. She's a former Republican congresswoman from Northern Virginia. She was shepherding a group that was lobbying for this panel. The group included the mother and girlfriend of Brian Sicknick, the Capitol Police officer who died as a result of the January 6th assault, and two other officers. Barbara Comstock joins me now. Barbara, welcome back to Meet the Press. Let me start with, I want to put up the statement that um, Gladys Sicknick put out before you guys started your meetings on Capitol Hill. And she said, I suggest that all congressmen and senators who are against this bill visit my son's grave in Arlington National Cemetery. And while there, think about what their hurtful decisions will do to those officers who will be there for them going forward. She said this Wednesday, you had 36 hours trying to convince these skeptical Republican senators to do this. Why didn't this message convince more to support this commission? Well, uh, thank you, Todd, for showing that statement. And Mrs. Sicknick had such a grace and, and quiet courage and spoke very directly to these members. And I do think because of what she did and Brian's partner and Sandra and also Officer Frenone and Officer Dunn, that we will have a thorough investigation. I would have preferred that that be an independent outside investigation that was nonpartisan. I think that would remove it from the political sphere and allow Republicans and Democrats to return to working on the issues that they all say they want to work on. 
But I think now it'll be an investigation in Congress. And one thing that did happen from our meetings this week is Lindsey Graham did promise to advocate that Officer Fanon and Officer um, Dunn and others who were on the front lines fighting in what was a medieval battle. A lot of people still don't realize how violent that was, that Officer Fanon was tased 12 times at the back of his neck, that he has traumatic brain injuries, and that he almost died that day. He suffered a heart attack. And people are still talking about these were like tourists. We need to have that full story out. It's going to get out one way or the other. And I think because of the courage of Mrs. Sicknick um, and the sadness that she's going to have over this Memorial Day weekend, as will all of the Sicknick family, but I think their courage will prevail and that we will get to the truth. Look, I want to put up a, a, a screen here of all the senators you did meet with, uh, that you had a chance to meet with. And, and five of this group um, did vote for the commission uh, of your meetings. But a majority that you met with did not. So, and I look at certain people here. Um, let's go to James Langford. This is somebody uh, I think you and I both know him well. I, I, have, I have no doubt he's somebody torn on this. A Roy Blunt is another one that you would think is torn on this. But they're very, they're very loyal to Mitch McConnell. Tell me about those conversations. Bring me in the room. Well, certainly all of the senators, you know, many of them did acknowledge that what, what many Republicans have not acknowledged, which is that this was a violent, you know, assault on the Capitol that can never happen again and that it does need to be thoroughly investigated. They didn't seem to think that this was the answer. And that's why I say, you know, this will still be investigated because subpoenas will get the facts. We'll find out who organized that mob, how it was orchestrated, who directed them down to the Capitol to assault the Capitol. So and, and, and we also, you know, you did show who had, uh, who we met with and who voted for it. Uh, Senator Sass also had communicated mm -hmm. with us and he also supported it, as is did Senator Toomey, who we met with, indicated he would have supported it had he been present. So I am still optimistic that we will, I know we will, the truth will come out. You right. know from you know, decades past that I have worked on investigations and when people try and hold these things back, it always comes out in the end. That's why I think both for the country yeah. as well as for Republicans, it would be better to do it sooner rather than later. And I know we can yeah. get those subpoenas out, whether it's bipartisan means. I, I hope Nancy Pelosi, if she sets up a commission, that it'll be exactly like the one that was designed, that it's five it Democrats, five Republicans, yeah. that they share power and that they get the people who care about this. Certainly the 35 House Republicans that voted for an investigation would be a good place to start to get five Republicans right. who will who will work on this and Let me, get to the answers that our office, our officers are hurting right now. People need to know that those Capitol officers that they walk by every day, they want a commission. Right. They are hurting. They are leaving in droves. They're leaving faster than they can be replaced. I, I want to, I want to play something. This has to be addressed. I'm curious. I want to play something that Bill Cassidy said, because I thought it was what he put together what I thought yes. could have been an effective argument to convince skeptical Republicans to vote for the commission. Here was his rationale. Ask the American people, are they more likely to trust an independent commission not composed of members of Congress, or are they more likely to trust one handpicked by Speaker Pelosi? Mm -hmm. Pretty clear who they would most trust. And I think this is as much as anything about building trust with the American people. You and I both know I could picture Mitch McConnell in, a, in another world making the case for this commission using Bill Cassidy's argument. Well, that was exactly the argument that we were making to the senators, and Senator Cassidy is exactly right. And he was so gracious in meeting with the family. And he even indicated, you know, how close his family um, was to Capitol Police officers and how his daughter um, had, had been close to them since she grew up in this area. So we were, he, he makes the best case. And I talked to one of the 35, you know, I've talked to a number of the 35 in the House who voted for it. And that's exactly the argument that those who voted for it made right. to their constituents, some of whom aren't happy that they're doing this. But that's the whole point. It would be nonpartisan. But it's this protection, I think, and 
I understand Republicans want to get away from Donald Trump. I mean, if Donald Trump disappeared tomorrow, I don't think you'd have many Republicans in the search party. Right. Maybe a few prosecutors, but not Republicans. <laughs> hey, so but, they want to get away right. from him. But it, the problem is he's not going to go away. But this is not about Democrats or Republicans. It's about the country and it's about getting to the truth. And it's about protecting yeah. the Capitol, the people who work there, and also making sure this never happens again. And, and, and that's what the family so eloquently communicated. And I think, uh, obviously, Senator Cassidy uh, right. captured very, that well. Very quickly, Barbara Comstock, the, Chuck Schumer has promised one more vote on this commission, at least. Do you think you'll get a face-to-face -face between um, the sick Nick family members and Mitch McConnell? Well, Senator McConnell's um, office had offered to have a meeting with the staff. It was late in the day. It had been a long day for the family. And at that point, given they had indicated where the vote was going to be, that was passed on. But I, we would be happy to meet with any of the other senators to discuss really why Senator Cassidy is right. Senator Romney, you know, discussed yeah. that in the same way, as did Lisa Murkowski made she was our last meeting of the day, and she was so gracious and kind to the family and really apologizing to Mrs. Sicknick that she should even have to be there on this painful Memorial Day weekend when her son lies at Arlington National Cemetery, as she pointed out, because he fought so well. I mean, Officer Fanone said to many of the senators, he said, we were so good at our job that day. I don't think a lot of you realize what danger you yep. were in. What could have happened from this mob that was saying, hang Mike Pence? And I think Officer Fanon is exactly right, which and he will be heard in public and should be, okay. as should so many of the other officers who are on the front line. Barbara Comstock, a former member of Congress from Northern Virginia, thank you for coming on and sharing your experiences this week. Um, thank you. Um, with the family members and thank the officers. You. So joining me now is Democratic Congressman Jason Crow of Colorado. He's the former Army Ranger. He helped protect many of his fellow members of Congress on that frightful day on January 6th. He, of course, became an impeachment manager as well. Congressman Crow, welcome to meet the press. Um, so I guess the question now is, where do we go now? Where does this go next? And, and do you, would you like to see Speaker Pelosi, if this is now a House-driven investigation, essentially follow the parameters of the commission um, that they wanted to develop to try to give as much credibility as you can to this investigation. Well, good morning, Chuck. Thanks for having me on. I mean, the, the question first is one of timing, right? So if Mitch McConnell has said that uh, we are going to uh, take another vote on this, I think the question for uh, Speaker Pelosi and Chuck Schumer is, you know, do we believe him that this will be a vote in good faith? Uh, you know, we had 54 votes on Friday. Uh, we think there were a couple of more people that would have voted for it had they been present. So the question is, can we get those three or four additional votes uh, or are we just delaying the inevitable? And that is, are we going to have to take up a select committee right. uh, on uh, the House side uh, or some kind of House and Senate combined committee and do this ourselves? So I, I don't know. I can't read their minds at this point, but this has to get done. Uh, I, I am sick of playing the, the game of whack-a-mole with GOP members in the Congress. You know, every time we, uh, you know, address one of their concerns, another one pops up. It's like playing whack-a-mole at yeah. Chuck E. Cheese growing up. Uh, we just can't continue to do that forever. We need to get answers. There's an urgency to this. Let's not forget that this is not a, um, a process in the integrity of history, uh, although that is important. We have a growing violent extremism movement, movement in the United States. Uh, we have uh, the spreading of the big lie that's being used to further voter suppression laws around the country. Uh, and a growing number of Republicans are actually starting to believe more and more the big lie and undermine the legitimacy of the Biden presidency. So this is a problem that is prescient. It's growing. And we have to address it with some timeliness. Now, you sound like somebody like me who's got a little bit of hope that maybe, hey, there's going to be one more vote for this commission. And maybe after they go home, maybe some there's a couple more minds that will change. But let's assume that doesn't happen. Is there any other uh, alternative, a presidential commission from Joe Biden, uh, a joint task force of the FBI. Is there any other method you would you would suggest before going the select committee in Congress? Well, I think it's really important is that we have some sort of bipartisan commission here. You know, we have to make sure we're doing this in a way that uh, helps re-inspire trust and confidence of the American people 
uh, in our institutions and we have to have subpoena power and we have to get the information that you can't get to necessarily with other investigations. I mean, there's a GAO investigation going on right now that I actually asked for uh, as a member of the House. Yeah. There are IG investigations that are going on right now. But what we really need to know is what was Donald Trump doing uh, in the hours before the riot, during the riot? What was he talking to or telling his advisors? What, what happened with that discussion with Kevin McCarthy? Those are things that I think uniquely we can get through only through a bipartisan commission or a select committee with subpoena power that would be very, very hard for another government ent entity or agency to get to. Um, I'm sure you've had some constituents say this to you, which is if you can't have a bipartisan agreement on something like this that normally would be above politics, think 9-11, think the Iraq study group. We could go through many uh, instances of, of traumatic events in this country where bipartisanship eventually um, was used to get to the bottom of things. If you can't do it for this, uh, does this mean bipartisanship is really dead on any issue? Well, I share that question. I really do, Chuck. I mean, listen, I was there on January 6th. You know that. Um, I made the call to my wife, uh, told her I loved her. I didn't know whether I would be able to make it out of that chamber like dozens of other members, like journalists, like police officers that were there. Over 140 were beaten. One was killed. One later took his life. Um, it was a terrible, uh, brutal and violent day. And let's not forget, you know, the hours and the days after that attack, the way that my GOP colleagues were asked or were, were, you know, they were with <laughs> the way they were talking, the way they were acting. I remember actually very specifically hours after we had retaken the Capitol and gone in and recertified the election. Kevin McCarthy gets up on the House floor. And we were all sitting there on the House floor. There was still the smell of tear gas and broken glass all over. And he gave this speech about how people held the breach against the mob and made sure that the House chamber yeah. hadn't been taken. Uh, he actually called me out by name and several other members. And then you fast forward a couple of months and it really wasn't a big deal. Uh, it's all about politics. Um, you know, I, I uh, am an optimist by nature, I think just like you, Chuck, but um, that's being strained right now because you know, the impact of fear, the fear of Donald Trump yeah. and the impact of power, the desire for power by certain elements in the GOP is overriding, you know, that patriotism, that desire to, to do what's necessary for the good of the country. Uh, and, and it's uh, frankly very depressing. Jason Crow, uh, an Army Ranger veteran himself on this Memorial Day weekend. Um, thanks for coming on and sharing your perspective with us, sir. I appreciate it. Thanks, Chuck. When we come back on this Memorial Day weekend, if Congress can't even agree on an independent January 6th commission, what can it agree on? Panel is next. Welcome back. The panel is with us. It's NBC News White House correspondent Jeff Bennett, former Obama deputy campaign manager Stephanie Cutter. Aisha Roscoe, White House correspondent for NPR, and former White House political director for George W. Bush, Sarah Fagan. Sarah, I want to start with you. I want to put up two quotes here and, and try to have you explain um, why one is winning out over the other. First, Mitch McConnell from Thursday morning. If we set up this commission, I think the basic goal of our Democratic friends is to keep relitigating in public what happened back on January 6th, rather than getting to a quick solution through arrests of those who did it and security adjustments to make sure it never happens again. And here's Lisa Murkowski. We just can't pretend that nothing bad happened or that people just got too excitable. Something bad happened and it's important to lay that out. Is the answer simply politics? Well, look, I think all things being equal, uh, we should have this style of a commission. Uh, I think many people would agree that. They certainly would agree with it privately. I think, however, you know, uh, what the leader indicated in his quote there was, in fact, that there is no trust by Republicans that this commission would be anything other than a political weapon used to defeat Republicans in elections. And so Republicans find themselves in a difficult situation, at least politically, 
which is to say, you know, if you go forward with this commission, all you're doing is setting yourselves up for months of conversation about Donald Trump, which, as Barbara Comstock just indicated, they want to go away. And likely the timing of that would be used uh, in the worst possible way months before the election. Look, I remember I was in the White House during the 9-11 Commission. And even though that was truly a bipartisan effort, there were moments of partisanship. And and the timing of it was sometimes conducted in a way uh, you know, to conduct politics as much as finding out the facts. And Republicans now just mm. don't believe that this will be anything other than politics. Stephanie Cutter, it, it, I mean, however you want to look at it, it sounds like they're afraid of the outcome, that that's what it is. They're afraid of what is going to be found out. Well, they're afraid of the truth. But you know who else they're afraid of? What else they're afraid of? They're afraid of Trump. This is more about their politics with Trump than it is their politics with Democrats. Trump doesn't want this commission because the truth will come out and there'll be complicity uh, all over the White House and all over Congress uh, for what happened on that day for the insurrectionists. And when that happens, Trump, you know, Trump will be volatile as he usually is. Trump will impede their ability uh, politically to take back the House and the Senate. Trump is a factor here and we need to acknowledge that. You know, Jeff Bennett, there were 11 senators who didn't vote on this. Um, and I, and I want to put them up of the 11 because we have an idea. Two of the 11 missing voters were Democrats. I think we know how they'd go. Pat Toomey indicated how he would go. Now, Richard Burr, who voted to convict the president for his act, former president for his actions on January 6th, actually said he would not vote for this commission. But you look at folks like Roy Blunt, Mike Brown, Mike Rounds, without Mitch McConnell demanding a vote a no on this. Does this commission go forward? That's the question I have. I mean, you have Chuck Schumer saying that he's going to bring this up for a vote uh, sometime in the in the near future, but it doesn't appear what would be different between now and then. Even if you have Kirsten Sinema and Patty Murray and uh, Pat Toomey and a couple of other Republicans, that still doesn't get you to the 60 that you need. And to your earlier question about is this all about politics, I think the answer there, Chuck, is yes. Republican lawmakers have been surprisingly frank about their political mm -hmm. aversion to this commission. Think back to the, the second impeachment of Donald Trump. You had Republican lawmakers at the time saying, you know what, we don't need a second impeachment. These questions are better investigated by a bipartisan commission. Mission. Democrats on the House gave Republicans everything they wanted in these negotiations, and in the Senate, it couldn't even pass a test vote. Mitch McConnell, the day after Donald Trump said he did not support a commission, Mitch McConnell said, you know what, I don't support it either, and he began lobbying his members uh, to object to it. So, and John Thune has said clearly that he doesn't want voters in the midterm elections to be thinking about Donald Trump and what happened on January 6th. So to your, to your question, is it all about politics? Yes, the question is, there, there's a short-term solution, but does that really meet the needs of Republicans? Because if House Speaker Nancy yeah. Pelosi uh, comes up with a Democratic-led commission, you know, she has control of the subpoenas, she has control right. of the timing, and it could really raise the political potency of whatever this commission finds. Yeah, I, I don't understand the rationale that somehow if this commission doesn't exist, that somehow people are going to stop talking about January 6th. Aisha, I, I want to put up a quote here from Tim Kaine, because it takes us to sort of the next, perhaps, um, avenue of where this story is heading. And he said this, if he can't get a Republican to support a nonpartisan analysis of why the Capitol was attacked the first time since the War of 1812, then what are you holding out hope for? Meaning, this is about the filibuster. This is about 50 votes. This is about the idea, if you can't get bipartisanship here, where are you going to get it? Well, and, and that's really the question. I mean, there there's a question of how sustainable is this, right, to have the uh, to have uh, a situation where the the you can't even get Republicans and Democrats on the same page about an attack on the Capitol, on the seat of government. And that and you have people saying, look, this is not sustainable. But you have Republicans who are saying this is about making sure that Trump, that we're not talking about Trump in January 6th. Of course, the problem with that is Trump is talking about what happened in the election. He's not letting it go. And he's still leading the Republican Party. So you still are going to have, regardless of whether uh, they have this bipartisan commission, you are going to have talk about this. And Republicans aren't going to be able to escape it. You know, Sarah Fagan, I guess that's the question, you know, you, you've rightly said many Republicans want to put Trump in the rearview mirror. Um, 
But Trump's almost in some ways looks to be more empowered by the fact that Republicans are going along with his demands. Well, I think uh, to some degree, perhaps that's true. But I think, you know, the notion that you're going to to do a commission with live televised hearings, you know, weeks or days before elections is probably what gives people pause. And I think for something like this to pass, there would be need to be a lot of things worked out from committee members to chairman to Mm -hmm. staff to timing. And I doubt seriously Democrats would go along with with that. I'm not certain, though, I uh, agree that um, this commission not coming together means that other legislation can't get done. I think we're at a a very partisan time in our political history and anything uh, getting done is difficult. But this is arguably among the most political things that will come up, just given the nature of it, given the personalities involved, that I don't think this means an infrastructure deal can't get done. All right. Well, or certainly not criminal justice reform. We we will see if those are uh, precious, uh, precious remarks on that one. Look, I'm going to hit the pause button here when we come back. Why more people are saying China needs to be more transparent about the origins of the COVID pandemic. That's next. Welcome back. Did the coronavirus leak from the Institute of Virology in Wuhan, China? The WHO has dismissed the idea. For months, most scientists scoffed at it. And for many, the lab leak idea got tangled up in politics and conflated with the idea that the Chinese deliberately released the coronavirus into the world. There's no evidence for that. But while the jump from an animal to humans remains the most accepted theory, a growing number of scientists are increasingly open to the lab leak possibility. One reason? Last week, we learned that three Chinese researchers working at the Wuhan lab became so ill with flu-like symptoms in November of 2019 that they had to be hospitalized. That's just when experts believe the virus itself began to spread in Wuhan. Now, President Biden, who himself never dismissed the lab leak theory, has ordered the United States intelligence agencies to investigate the origins of this virus. Well, joining me now is Matthew Pottinger, who is the deputy national security advisor under President Trump. He was an early critic of China's handling of this pandemic. Uh, And he joins me now, Mr. Pottinger. Welcome to Meet the Press. And I want to start uh, actually with something that the Secretary of State said to me a couple weeks ago when I asked him a a very point blank question of whether China knows the answer already. Here's what he said to me. Here's what I think China knows. I think China knows that uh, in the early stages of COVID, it didn't do what it needed to do, which was to, in real time, give access to international experts, in real time to share information, in real time to uh, uh, provide real transparency. So I start with that premise here. There's certainly, I think, now a collective agreement that China has not uh, told the full story. What information in the next 90 days do you expect our intelligence community to be able to surface that will give us a better understanding of what happened? Hey, Chuck, it's great to be with you. And uh, Secretary Blinken certainly certainly right in that. You asked earlier in the show what what is an area where we can finally have some bipartisan consensus, and this is actually one of them. Uh, We had uh, an amendment that was passed that was put forward by Senators Gillibrand and uh, Senator Marshall uh, calling for an in-depth inquiry into the origins of this. And then, of course, President Biden had his bombshell statement uh, calling on the the, intelligence community to do a 90-day review to try to come up with a definitive answer about this. I think there's a lot that can be learned in 90 days. Uh, It's conceivable that we'll have an answer, and even if we come up short with a definitive answer, what we're going to have is a foundation for additional revelations to come out uh, from scientists around the world who are now going to be emboldened because they know that this is a priority of the United States. Scientists who previously were frightened of being canceled you know, by the, the Twitter mob uh, are, are going to contribute to this endeavor. What insights on the origin of the virus? Look, you were early on. You were known as one of the you were the first person, I think, to wear a mask inside the in the Oval Office. Early on, you were hearing about this in December. Um, what do you feel like you know about the origins that you think need to be threads that need to be pulled? 
Well, yeah, first of all, we, we have to agree that it's absolutely essential to find out what the origin of this thing is. Uh, it, it's essential for us to head off the next pandemic. It's essential for us to better understand the variants of the current pandemic that, that are uh, emerging. And uh, this virus could mutate in ways that undermine our, our miraculous vaccines. Uh, and it also opens up really an overdue conversation about uh, uh, how to govern really cutting edge but risky uh, genetic research, including gain of function research and, and, uh, uh, and the like, you know, synthetic biology. Uh, so I, I think that um, uh, there's actually an enormous amount that, that could come out. What we know right now is that both of these hypotheses that President Biden spoke of uh, are, are valid. It could have emerged from a laboratory. It could have emerged from nature. Both of those are valid. Neither of them uh, is supported by concrete evidence, but there's, there's a growing amount of circumstantial evidence in particular supporting the idea that this may have leaked from a laboratory. You know, the Washington Post indicated uh, over the weekend that there is unexamined intelligence that folks are going to be going through, which of course leads to the question of, what happened in the in, in 2020 uh, did did in some ways the the sort of uh, irrational attacks on China, did that slow down efforts of the intelligence community to actually do some fact finding? Well, look, I, I think what what slowed down efforts more than anything else were the uh, early statements that were published by a few scientists dismissing the idea that it could have come out of a lab, and in fact, caricaturing people who, who thought that it might c have come out of a lab. Uh, I, I think that it, 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 there was Do no shred of evidence to support you think your former boss's statements contributed uh, to that view. a little bit? Well, you know, I, I, the, the, there, there are political mistakes uh, that, uh, that lead to, to, to uh, you know, trouble in government, and then there are institutional shortcomings. I, I think that this is more of an institutional shortcoming where the intelligence community, uh, in truth, had really, had really looked to the CDC to have the lead, mm -hmm. uh, to be the lead agency to, to monitor for, uh, for outbreaks and the like. There's a lot of work <clears throat> that I think the intelligence community needs to do uh, to build up its capacity to monitor uh, the, these sorts of threats. And by the way, if this investigation expands not only uh, to encompass the intelligence community, uh, but but really our national labs like Lawrence Livermore and also to rely on our allies, third countries like France. Remember, yeah. France built the Wuhan Institute of Virology. I'm very eager to know what, what the yeah. French uh, w would be able to share in terms of insights and cooperation. I'm curious, do you think we could, if, if we have to go to China to get the facts that we need and you need cooperation in the Chinese government and they've decided to cover this up for whatever reason. Maybe they don't want to admit to their people they knew about it sooner, right? There's all sorts of reasons they did this. Can we ever actually get a definitive answer? Uh, I think we can. Uh, it might take more than 90 days. Uh, but look, if this thing came out of a lab, there, there are people in China who probably know that. Uh, we know that there were a lot of scientists in China. China has incredible and, and ethical scientists, many of whom in the early stages of the pandemic came out to say that they suspected that this was a lab leak. Right. Even, even the Wuhan Institute of Virology head at first said her first thought was, was this a leak from my lab? So those people have been systematically silenced uh, by their government. Now that the world uh, knows that how important this is to the United States, the United States, when we lead, uh, the world follows, that might also provide moral courage to many of these ethical right. scientists in, in China for whom I think this is, this is weighing on their consciences. I think, I think that we're going to see more information uh, come out as a result of this inquiry. Well, let's hope it doesn't take as long as it did with the Soviet Union and Chernobyl. But anyway, Matthew Pottinger, um, the former Deputy National Security Advisor, uh, thank you for coming on and sharing your perspective with us. I appreciate it. Thanks, Chuck. All right, we want to get a scientific perspective on this debate as well. So joining me now is Dr. Peter Hotez. He's, of course, he's the director of the Texas Children's Hospital Center for Vaccine Development, really one of the nation's leading experts on all things of infectious diseases. Dr. Hotez, welcome back to Meet the Press. So let me start with this. How important is it to know the origin of COVID? It's absolutely essential, uh, Chuck, and here's the reason why. This is now our third major coronavirus epidemic slash pandemic of the 21st century. We had the original SARS in 2002, 2003 that arose out of southern China, affected Toronto, Ontario. 
Then we had uh, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome come out in 2012 and caused a terrible epidemic in South Korea in 2015. This is the third one, and nature is already telling Mother Nature is telling us what's going to happen. There's going to be COVID-26 and COVID-32 unless we fully understand the origins of COVID-19. And uh, this is absolutely critical. And what's needed, and and you know what what I'm concerned about is I I think the intelligence community has been all over this for the last uh, year and a half. It's mm-hmm. it's not like they've not made efforts. I I think we've I, I'm personally of the opinion that we've pushed intelligence about as far as we can. What we need to do is we need to do an outbreak investigation. We need a team of scientists, of epidemiologists, virologists, uh, bat ecologists in Hubei province for a six to six month year long period and fully unravel the origins of COVID-19. That includes collecting virus samples and, and blood samples from uh, domestic livestock, from from bats, from laboratory animals, it means doing the same for people living in the endemic area. Remember, there are some indications that this may have actually started in Hubei province as early as the summer of, of 2019. And the South China Morning Post reported right. that the first known case was uh, in, in November. So um, there's a lot going for natural origins, but it also means interviewing the scientists too and, and, and looking at log, uh, lab notebooks. We have to do this. It, it's it's can, not only in the national interest right. of China and the United States, it's it's in our global interest. Can it be done without China's cooperation? I guess that's like, I mean, is this one of those things where we are stuck having to figure out how to get just to just to get the epidemiologists in country to do these things? Can this be done without China's cooperation? Yeah, I don't see how. I think we have to really put a lot of pressure on China, including possible sanctions, to allow a team of outstanding epidemiologists and virologists in China with unfettered access to to animals, to people, to samples, to the lab. And it's not going to be quick. It's going to take a long time. And by the way, it's in China's own national interest to do this right. because two now two of the major coronavirus pandemics have come out of China and and the likely and if you've ever been to that part of China we right. did a lot of work in China in the 1990s you know it's this vast mixing bowl of in Hubei province right. uh, north of Dongting Lake it met this vast mixing bowl of 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 goats and and pigs and and ducks and chickens and uh, high population density that's yeah. why all the in, all the influenza viruses often arise out of China as well and so we've got to figure this out is there uh is there any way to sci- scientifically prove that this occurred naturally without going to China because they've yet to it seems like it hasn't been replicated yet with bats explain that well I think that that's exactly what we need to do we need to uh, that's why I'm talking about full access um, we I think you know really a detailed analysis of bat populations um, uh, all of the possible reservoir animals and, and people and without that it's going to be really hard to, to sort this out it could be that some of the Chinese scientists are already doing this I haven't seen a lot published coming out of China about right. that but this is this is we know how to do this, and, and we were able to unravel it for other right. major pandemics. So we could do this for COVID-19. We have the tools. Dr. Peter Otez, really appreciate you coming on and sharing your expertise with us to, to break down this story. Thank you, sir. Up next, we're going to look back at something 100 years ago tomorrow to one of the darkest moments in American history and one of the least known as well. I will never forget the violence of the white mob when we left our home. I still see black men sin being shot, black bodies lying in the street. I have lived through the massacre every day. Our country may forget this history, but I cannot. Welcome back. That was 107-year-old Viola Fletcher testifying before Congress about the Tulsa massacre. It was 100 years ago tomorrow that mobs of whites rampaged through the black Greenwood neighborhood of the city of Tulsa. When the shooting and looting by whites was over, hundreds of African-Americans were dead and some 35 blocks of the neighborhood was torched, including the thriving business district known as the Black Wall Street. Our own Tremaine Lee is in Tulsa for us this morning. And Tremaine, sadly for many Americans, they're learning about this incident for the very first time. 
That's right, Chuck. History during the best of times is messy and complicated. Then you add in the kind of violence that we experienced here in the Greenwood neighborhood 100 years ago, and it's even more so. And that's part of the, the issue here is that for so long this history has been buried, intentionally so. The government and the powers that be were all complicit in burying this story. Evidence was disappearing from the police department. Newspaper stories were mysteriously evaporating from city libraries. This was simply pushed under the rug, but no more. The black community here had long been raising their voices and now, finally, maybe they're being heard, Chuck. And Tremaine, it is amazing to me, 83% of Oklahomans says they've never been taught about this. This is in the state of Oklahoma, let alone nationally. Think about that, 83%. And what happens is often we want to take a, you know, the black history and silo it off. But when you don't engage with black history and the black experience as part of the, the whole American experience, then you're leaving a gaping hole in our history as Americans. And so the fact that 83% of Oklahoma has never heard this story, imagine what that, that number looks like nationwide. And that is a terrible shame and a stain on our history, Chuck. Anyway, Tremaine Lee, who's in Tulsa for all the events, plus your debut in your own documentary, Tremaine, thanks very much. And in fact, you can watch... Tremaine's documentary, Blood on Black Wall Street, tonight, 10 p.m. Eastern on MSNBC, and then anytime you want on our streaming service, Peacock. When we come back, Race in America, then and now. Welcome back. The panel is back with us. President Biden will mark the one day anniversary of the Tulsa massacre with a visit to the city on Tuesday. And as Tremaine Lee and I just discussed, it was only recently that many of us even heard of the Tulsa massacre, certainly I don't remember being taught it in school. I learned it later. And one reason we did, though, hear of it, maybe because of the trauma of George Floyd's murder one year ago and the reexamination of America's troubled racial history that it sparked. You know, Jeff Bennett, in my home state of Florida, we weren't talk, uh, taught about Axe Handle Sunday, which was a, uh, a, a, a race, a massacre of African-Americans in, in the city of Jacksonville. Uh, Eighty-three percent of Oklahomans. Do you think without George Floyd, these commemorations this weekend are as, are, as, uh, are as big as they are. You know, I think that's, I think that's a fair assessment. I think that the graphic nature of that video that captured George Floyd's killing, it ha happening during a, during a pandemic where people were isolated and really had nowhere else to avert their attention, it really opened people's eyes not only to that injustice, but to other forms of injustice as well. And I think you rightly point out, Chuck, it wasn't just Tulsa. There were other race massacres as well in Louisiana, Wilmington, North Carolina. There was there was Rosewood as well. And and there are layers to this injustice. Miss Viola Fletcher, who we heard from earlier in the broadcast, is 107 years old. She testified when she was here before Congress and I had a chance to meet her that because of the massacre, her family had to move. She never completed school beyond the fourth grade. She never, as a result of that, made a lot of money. The most she's ever done is, is be a, a housekeeper. And to this day, she still has trouble supporting herself financially. She's 107 years old. The Centennial Commission in Tulsa has raised $30 million, and not a single penny has been given to the three known survivors, Chuck. You know, Aisha, I want to put up something Jelani Cobb wrote that I thought was uh, pretty, uh, pretty poignant. He said this. These two Memorial Days point inescapably, not only to those who have died on battlefields abroad, but to the theaters of conflict at home and the freighted politics of race, grief, and culpability. You know, how can we continue, frankly? I mean, I think that this has been a moment where we're opening the eyes of more Americans on, uh, on our history. Uh, can we have more of this? Well, I think when you talk about what happened with George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd and the response to that, uh, and then you, you, you look at what happened in Tulsa, the survivors of Tulsa are now over 100 years old. It's been 100 years and there still has not really been justice. They're still fighting for justice. They're still looking for reparations. And not only did you have the violence of that, what happened in 1921, but you had all of the, the state violence that happened afterwards where they weren't allowed to get loans, they weren't allowed to rebuild. And this was not, this was not an isolated incident. And while you might not have had uh, mass violence on this scale, you had so many things happening to black people in this country. And so that's part of what was sparked last year with the murder of George Floyd, that there have been all of these instances, that there has been all of this violence, and there still has been no real justice. And so I think that's why you see people looking for 
and asking for answers. Mm -hmm. and, and this has to be talked about um, if you're going to get uh, any type of, uh, if you're going to have anything happen in this com country that changes. And I will point out on Memorial Day that you've had black people fighting for this country right. for from the beginning and coming home and being lynched in their uniforms, being tortured and attacked yeah. in their uniforms. Black people have fought for this country. You know, Sarah Fagan, you talked about, you actually were trying to talk a little more optimistically about bipartisanship earlier. Police reform might be the one place. Is this going to, you know, will, uh, is this going to be the place where Republicans join Democrats on something when it comes to racial injustice? I think that they can definitely get something done and they need to get something done. I think look, one of the positive outcomes of the George Floyd tragedy was I think for a lot of white people in this country, for the first time they realized that a majority, perhaps a very strong majority of black men, you know, feel uncomfortable in the presence of police. And I think that cuts across, you know, uh, income, education level. And, you know, that that's a pretty rude awakening for people to sort of step back and say, wow, I didn't know that. And uh, yes, there are things that need to get done. At the same time, I think it's important to acknowledge the vast majority of police officers in this country mm -hmm. uh, uh, get up every day and do a, a very fine job and certainly are not uh, racist. And I think what happens so much in politics is that we overcorrect. And so while police reform is need, needed and it's important, I think it, it can get passed. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we've seen the defund police movement go too far. We've seen crime rise. We've seen yeah. homicides rise. And that disproportionately hurts black Americans. Um, Stephanie Cutter, I know that the, the president met with the Floyd family. I want to put up something that George, I want to play some sound here of what George Floyd's brother said, because I had not heard this metaphor before, but I thought it was pretty powerful. Take a listen. If you can make federal laws to protect the bird, which is the bald eagle, you can make federal laws to protect people of color. Stephanie, this is this is something I think President Biden wants to be a legacy. Absolutely. And I think George Floyd's brother right there summed it up. Like, why can't we do this? Um, and, you know, I, I agree with most everything that's been said on this program um, about race relations and the awakening that's happened since George Floyd's death. But let's not forget, even just this year, a thousand people have lost their lives because of police violence. Yeah. So this yeah. this is not a new problem. This problem is not going to go away overnight. Right. You know, I think overcorrecting on this issue is certainly in the eyes of the beholder. And for African-American men across this country, why not overcorrect this right. so that be saved and they can live in this country without fear of their own police officers supposed right. to be protecting them right. actually in their lives. Look, I think a lot of people would like to see what overcorrecting looks like first before we before we get upset about it. Anyway, look, tremendous panel. Thank you all today. And thank you all for watching. I hope you can enjoy the rest of your Memorial Day weekend. We'll be back next week because if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press.